Hello, and welcome to Advanced Indexing with RavenDB. Indexes in RavenDB are about making data fast, but there's a lot more. As a document database, RavenDB lets you do lots of interesting things with indexing. You can apply aggregation on your data to derive additional information from it. Using our RavenDB ETL, you can transform your data from the write database to the read database, which can be critical for a microservices application. You can move your business logic into the database layer. Say you have a product catalog and need to allow a user to search by price, but there are different prices for different users. A VIP customer gets a different price than a normal customer. RavenDB allows you to perform these computations at indexing time. Users can say to your application, I want to see my prices for my products. I want them ordered by price and I want to search on them. Today, RavenDB CEO Oren Aney will walk you through some of the more advanced features of RavenDB indexing and showcase its capabilities. If you have any questions, at any time, click the Q&A button at the bottom of your screen, and Oren will be happy to answer them at the end of the presentation. If you're watching from our RavenDB Facebook page, just ask your question in the comments section, and Oren will be happy to answer. Enjoy, and here's Oren. Hi, everyone. Welcome to this webinar. In the, previous, in the previous webinar, I showed off some of the features around uh, managing data at scale in distributed environment. And it came, to, it came to pass that we haven't actually touched on what is probably one of the core features of RevenDB because we ha it has been with us for so long. So I want to talk a little bit about indexing. And the first thing that we need to, in, to understand is what are indexes. And typically when you talk about indexes, the answer is simple. They are there to make queries fast. That's it. And that's true. RevenDB uses indexes to make queries fast. But that is just the beginning of the journey with indexes. Let's look a little bit deeper behind the screen. Here we have an index and a query. Here is the query. And you can see that I'm looking on users where email equals something. Now, what is the index? The index is basically a sorted list of values. That's it. And you can see that the, uh, the values of the email points to a particular document in the storage. So when we actually do the query, we go to the index, go to the email field and says, okay, give me the value that is stored for Oren at revenue.net. And we get two. And then we go and get the document by ID. This is vastly oversimplification, but for the most part, this is how it works. So that's it. That's how it is to work, and we can go home. Except that this is the least interesting piece of Indexes in RevenDB. Because on top of this, we can build whole mountains. So let's see something slightly more complex. Indexes in RevenDB can be automated. This is when you just run a query. For example, this query, if you run it, will use an automatic index. Or you can define your own. And we're going to focus on user-generated indexes right now because those allows you to have the most flexibility capabilities. A few things to understand about indexes in RevenDB. If you're coming from a relational database background, you're used to having a, a bad choice to make when you need indexes. The more indexes you have, the slow writes become. But the less indexes you have, the slow reads become. So we have this annoying choice to make. And the sad thing about that is that in many cases, you don't actually want to make this choice, at least not globally. You just want to make it for that particular scenario. For example, if I'm now updating a, 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 a Facebook comment, it doesn't matter to anyone if that comment will be visible immediately or within a few milliseconds. In fact, it's typically going to take several seconds to show up if you're watching the page from a different part of the world. Now, RevenDB uses that same technology and allows us to update indexes in the background. Instead of operating on them immediately as part of the current, in the, of the current transaction, we process them behind the scenes. That allows us to do some amazing optimizations because instead of having to update the document, the index, once for every document update, we can aggregate and batch them. 
that end up being hugely important for performance. It also means that in the common case where you write and don't immediately need to read on the results, you don't have to wait. So that's a save on performance. We do make sure to give you a flag, whatever the data is or is not still. Now, the lag time of indexes is typically measured in milliseconds. So in many cases, you don't even need to think about that. When you do, you have an option of saying, oh, wait, I can either wait at right time for the indexes to update, in which case it behaves pretty much exactly the same as it is for a relational databases, or you, could, or you can wait at read time. Again, in this case, you make a query, you wait for all of the indexes to, for that particular index to complete the work that it has been doing, and then you get the results. Or you cannot do that and get whatever you have as soon as possible. Uh, the reason for this is mostly about making sure that there are as few blocks as possible by default. So you can enable that as you want. You can even enable that globally if you, if you so desire. But in general, we just want to go forward as soon as possible. Now, let's see what, it actually, what we can actually do with that. So here is a relatively simple index. And here are a few queries on this index. So the interesting thing is the total field. And you can see here that the total field is interesting because it, it is computed. It is computed and the, the computation is not that, that, not that interesting, but it's also not absolutely trivial. But the moment we have that, we can start doing all sorts of interesting things to it. For example, we can do a range query. We can apply facets on top of that. And remember the previous slide? What do I have here in the column for the total? I have the pre-computed values. So a query like this is going to be really, really fast because I have a sorted list of total values. Then I'm just going to be able to jump directly to anything that is greater than this value and give me all of the rest of values. Same here. The cost of doing that is minimal. If you compare that value, if you compare this approach to, again, using a relational database, you can have computed fields in a, a relational database. You can even have persistent computed fields if you have the right database and the right edition. But in general, you have to compute it during, in the, during write time. Again, coming back to the uh, different course. It's also the level of complexity you can manage in a, co in a computed column in a relational database is severely limited. With everybody, you have much more freedom and you have the ability to express things in a much richer way. Once we have this in the index, it behaves just like any other value. And we can operate that, aggregate over that, and use that very nicely. It means that instead of moving complex computation to query time, in which case we have to evaluate each row or each document that may apply for this particular value, we can do that once and then queries are fast. The idea of that queries should be fast and we should migrate cost elsewhere is very important to the mindset of RevenDB because you have a user right now waiting for the page to load. So let's give them the page as soon as possible. Now, so far, we've seen things using link. Here is index definition using link. But we can also define things using JavaScript. Now, there are two reasons why you may want to use JavaScript instead of link. One, you're not familiar with Link at all, or not familiar with C-Sharp. In this case, JavaScript has become the lingual fraqua, the lingual fraqua uh, of programming languages. Everyone knows it, very few likes it, but you know, that's the world that we live in. And it's available, it's here, it allows you to do sort of semi-functional stuff. But the key from our perspective, it also allows us to do imperative things, and we see exactly how it works in just a little bit. Uh, something to note about uh, the JavaScript. JavaScript and dates don't go very well together. If you need to deal with dates, it's usually better to use the uh, link syntax because you have a much richer date API. If you want to complain about that something, about, if you want to complain about JavaScript, 
Hadley, you remember it was written in 10 days in 95. Okay, here is a good example, or maybe not a good example, uh, of how we can define logic, imperative logic, inside of an index. And what you can see here, I have some business rules that decide what should the duration be. If the, if the mode is refurbished, then the duration should be half of what we usually offer. And there is some rules about whether it's our product or someone else's product, stuff like that. Now, this is something that you can absolutely write using link. But there are different cases, and if we have time in the end, I will show some of the more uh, crazy thing you can do with indexing, where it allows you to do more complex stuff. More interesting, notice that we don't have the same fields. When using JavaScript, the output is just here. What do you mean by that? The output here is variant in duration, but here, oh sorry, we have always variant in duration, but we can also add here additional fields. So I can say result dot color blue. So we have some way of doing dynamic fields in JavaScript because JavaScript is a dynamic language. Now, I'm not sure, this is business logic. If you have a lot of need to query, then it makes it very easy to, uh, uh, to, to shift course to indexing time. Now, we have a question, whatever it is possible to define the JavaScript indexes in an external file so that we could write test against them. And the answer is yes, but that mostly depends on you. So the whole idea is that you can define your indexes however you like, and the typical way that you deploy indexes is by creating something called abs inheriting from abstract index creation task. And the JavaScript has a, a class there, and you can pull that data in, uh, in that class from a file, and then test it easily like that. Uh, notice that uh, the JavaScript engine that we use is five plus something such that there's the whole function, so don't expect the latest and greatest uh, uh, JavaScript things, and you should probably not need them. Uh, anyway, something that is important, if you push too much uh, uh, business logic into the database, you are going to have to deal with how do you test, how do you deploy, all of those sort of things, and that matters. I haven't thought actually about uh, talking about index deployments, and but the whole idea with doing that is that the typical mode in which you deploy indexes is something like this. In this case, this is a time series index, but you inherit from something like this in your code, and you define, in this case, we're using the link syntax. There is also something here for C sharp. And this is inside your code. It allows you to store the data in source control. It's version alongside with your application. And I, during development, usually at startup, you would uh, run through all of those and says, oh, just generate those indexes. In development, you typ in uh, production, you typically have a button, okay, let's redeploy indexes or something like that. Now, let's talk about something slightly more interesting. I have a price that I need to set for products. Now, different customers have different prices, and each product may have different rules for those customers. And at query time, I want to be able to query and order by and give me all of the items in the food category that, are, that has the best price for this particular customer. And you can see that the actual logic here is trivial. Okay, let's apply the discount for VIP and gold members. That's it. But the key here is that at query time, I get to select which one of those fields I'm going to use. If this is a gold customer, we'll use a gold, VIP, etc., etc. That means that now, instead of having to deal with, oh, now I have to run this computation during the query based on which type of customer it is, and this is expensive, and how do I do ordering, all bunch of stuff like that, this is just there. Just select the appropriate field to run and run with that. This makes things very easy to work with. 
and some cases the uh, selection of the field that you want to query is going to be quite important to the actual query that you want. Uh, we'll touch on this a little bit more when we talk about dynamic indexes, the dynamic fields. But right now, let's talk about something interesting. The sample data set has suppliers that has a contact, companies that have a contact, and employees. But contacts has a full name, or just a name, but employees has a false and last name. I want to be able to search for people from across these three different collections. And I don't know how to do that. So I'm going to define three separate maps. And let me put it here. I'm going to create this here. And I'm going to define three separate maps for each one of those. And no, but notice that there is a problem here. I have name and first and last name. I have to remap this to have the same properties. One of the rules of multibap indexes is that they must have the same shape. Now, We just do this, the company is exactly the same. Now it's going to complain. Why are you complaining? Yes, because I forgot to close. Okay. Now let's look at the terms on the index. There should have been some terms here. Yes, it would be really helpful if I spell things properly. And now you can see something really interesting. We have Anne and Andrew, but we also have Anne Heikonen, I think. What's going on? And the answer here is that we use this as an array. And indexing array is when we are, a, indexing arrays is when we have a, something like that, and we index each one of the values in the array separately. We touch on that slightly uh, later. We can say, oh, you know what? I want to break this apart so I can index this properly. So now I'm using full text search. And now when I'm looking at the terms on the index, you can see that all of the terms has been broken. Now let's search for King and here is an employee. Let's search for Diaz, that's a supplier that has this particular contact. I'm going to go back here and expand. This thing, this sorted list, here's where you can see it. Here's the sorted list. And when Revel wants to search for Diaz, it goes and says, oh, what has the value of Diaz? And that's a supplier 10A, and then you see that. Uh, are we? Yes. Okay. So, the interesting thing about this is that I search for supplier, I search for a, I search for supplier, I search for a, a employee, I can search for all of them. And notice that I'm getting all of them together. This is a polymorphic query. I'm getting suppliers, I'm getting employees in the same location. If I'm querying that from my code, I have to make sure that this and this have the same uh, common interface or something like that. Or I can do some sort of projection. In this case, I have this, assuming that they have something short. And Felix is saying, yeah, the index editor really has a problem with sometimes the bigger character. Thank you, we will, we will be fixing that, I know. 
Uh, Flores is asking, how would you handle more complex pricing situations like price lists and quantity-based pricing? This is a great question. So let's try to answer that. So form P in docs.products. Yes, got me again. Now we have the price per unit and the usual thing. Now, interesting enough, the question is, what happens if I have quantity-based pricing? That's probably the easiest thing to do. So, a uh, So what would be in this quantity pricing? It would be something like uh, E up to 10. We're giving you this much discount. Up to, let's say 50, you get this much discount and Something like this. And now, I want to be able to query that. So the way to handle that is actually really interesting. I'm slightly jumping ahead. I'm going to say here. Now, what I have here, I have quantity pricing. Create field. A mean amount. And that's the way to handle that. Now, what's interesting about this, let's assume that the price is 10. This is going to generate the following fields. It's a, and this would be, let's say, etc. Now, the question here is whatever I have fixed sizes, or I can exactly do something slightly more and says, okay, let's generate not just this, but also now I have to generate 11 all the way to 20 where the value goes, let's say like this. And a lot depend on whatever you need, a, a specific ranges or not. Now, the, I'm going to touch on dynamic fields in slightly later. So we, we discuss the options here uh, later on. But in many cases, the idea here is that you want to shift a lot of the computation that you, that you want to do into the indexing time because then you're able to do some pretty complex stuff. For example, uh, it may be possible that for the quantity that you have, uh, one product has better uh, price and you want to sort that, you want to offer that to the customer directly. Those are things that tend to be really, really hard to do. If the complexity of your pricing strategy is really high, that's something that needs to be discussed externally. But for many cases, this is a really suitable method. Now, let's talk about full text search. What do we have when we have full text search? First of all, we have to understand what analyzer are. I will probably have a different webinar about full text search, and I think I have already have a, a couple of uh, videos on our YouTube page that discuss the internals of full text search. But the whole idea is that full text search uses an analyzer to break apart the, the text into meaningful segments. For example, in the case uh, when we defined full text search before, it broke apart the names in the index, talking about the people search, on world boundary. 
when we define for ourselves the default that we use is typically the standard analyzer which is somewhat more complex than world boundary but in conceptually that is what this is doing notice that we also have here an array and exactly as I said before each one of those would be passed to the analyzer to, the analyzer to be analyzed independently each one of those would generate terms independently now let's say that I have this in my index and I'm passing this value or in a trivialv.net the term from this is going to be one ORN because we have this split that gave me two values and then revenue.net and the full value here notice that this is an array this actually should be an object array that contains a string and a string array so the idea of breaking this apart also works for nested values Revenue also allows you to define your own analyzers and specify more complex things there. Uh, this gets more deeply into the realm of Lucene than I want to touch in this webinar. We'll touch that, uh, we touch on that on a later webinar. Now, let's talk about something really complex. We're taking the previous examples and showing you how you can query across vast number of fields in order to find the right value and this is actually really really interesting because if you look at that i'm saying i want to find an order by first name last name the order number which is typically unique the email or the split of the email so this allows me to search by the company email or oh, uh smith has left the company but john is still working there so i can typically get this as well uh, payment and file. So basically, I can get everything through this. This is uh, this is actually something that we use in production. This is how I find customers, and it's really really useful. Look at this. If I'm searching for Bob Smith, then I'm, we'll find anything that has Bob. I will find anything that is Smith. If it has both Bob and Smith, I'm able. To, uh, this is going to rank higher than anything else. This is a very natural way to find information. And the alternative to this would be form that has a field for each one of them. And that's just really annoying to try to figure, oh wait, what is this value that the user gave me? Is this the order number that I gave them? Is this the payment that they found from the credit card company? Is this the license ID? Sometimes you can tell, but sometimes, okay, this is just a random looking string. I can just figure it out and run with it and I get the right results. Geospatial queries, they suck. They suck because they tend to be non-intuitive. So let's talk about how Revenue handles that. First of all, here is a query and give me a, all of the order that shipped into a particular area, which if I'm not mistaken is somewhere around here, I think. And no, no, sorry, somewhere around here. That's the different one. Uh, it's very sad for me that I can look at these coordinates and guess where they are. I think this is around Seattle. And the interesting thing is, this is how you define a spatial feed. You give it a point. You can also give it a shape using a WKT. But the basic idea is that this is how it works. This is how it goes. Now, what, does, what happens when we have a spatial index? Well, what happened is that we divide the world into squares and then we divide it again and again and again and again and this looks something like this here we go here we go so you can see here that here is six and here is six and six nine would be somewhere around here because again, we, uh, the grid uh, goes down and down and down and down until we get to a particular location. And the more values you have here, the deeper the resolution becomes. So we can do something like this and here are all of the uh, things that were shipped into Buenos Aires, I think. Yeah, all of them are to Buenos Aires. And if we reduce the accuracy, we're getting now, it is Buenos Aires, it is also, let's see Buenos Aires. Okay. 
Okay, I'm trying to figure out what the difference are. Okay, so the address here is different. Let's try to reduce it even further. No, nope. that's the data we have. Oh, and if we go to six, this is now Brazil, because as you can see, this covers all of this. And no, so six nine would be here. Sorry, don't mind me with the attempt to figure out where geospatial happens automatically and magically. This tends to be non-intuitive because if you have a value here and a value here that are very near on the map, they may be very different from uh, the point of view of the spatial location that we have indexed. And there's a lot of math going on behind figuring out what ranges you need to query and a bunch of other stuff like that. The good thing about it is that you tend not to need to think about that. Even we handle all of this complexity. Uh, you can do queries on circles, you can do queries on give me everything that touches on a line and a bunch of other stuff that tend to be interesting or not depending on whatever you need special features. Now, let's talk about something quite interesting. Take a look at this index and let's think about what it does. This index allows me to search a document using a different document data. Let's see how it goes. Okay. And now we can see something really interesting. There are two managers in this data set, Andrew and Steven. If I'm searching for Steven, I'm getting some result. If I'm searching for Andrew, I'm getting other results. Now, this works, but what happens if I go, and here is Steven. I'm going to change his name to, let's say, Stu. Now I'm going to go here, and I actually have Steven here, which is interesting. Didn't I change it? Okay, that was not how the demo was supposed to go. Oh, there is a typo in my index definition. Joss is telling me. Where is that? Oh, yeah, oh, yeah, 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 yes. Sorry, that's kind of important. And if we don't get it right, and I should actually have gotten a warning about that. So now let's see that. Okay, so here is two. And let's go back and change two to Steven. So nothing matches two now. Everything matches Steven properly. Uh, Josh, thank you very much. That was very helpful. I would have been stuck on that. That would be very annoying. So, interesting happens. First of all, when the manager is updated, this gets re-indexed. That's huge because it means that you have the ability to ask really interesting questions. Or oh, give me the orders for a all of the, uh, give me the employees whose car is blue. And I can do that. And it doesn't have to sit in the same data. And Revenue B is in charge of actually doing this update. Now, something that we have to understand in this case, there is a downside. And downside is whenever the reference document changed, 
we have to index all of the referencing documents. So whenever Steven change, we have to update Michael, Robert, and Anne. And if there is just a few of them, that's great. If there is 200,000 or 2 million of them, that's less great. Then again, it also means that RevenDB is able to do that incrementally. So when the moment that Steven changes, you would update Michael Robert, and then we update Anne in the next batch. Notice that in any case, this happens after the fact. You would get the, and we can actually see that very nicely. I paused indexing. And let's go to employees. And your name now is Morgan. Now I'm querying, and I'm getting Stephen. Why I'm getting Stephen? Because if I'm going to look here, I have Stephen here. I haven't re-indexed yet. But notice that I'm getting a warning. The index is still. So, and this is specifically because if we don't do that, this is a problem. In particular, consider the case of what would happen if we had to update 200 referencing documents inside a transaction. This is actually something that we used to do in 2.5, and it led to the point where people had this one massive document that a large portion of the database uh, used, and at some point it hit the timeout limits, and we started be having a document that could not be updated, because updating that took so long that it effectively blocked everything and timed out. So RevenueB will manage update to the documents in the background as usual. If you need a, a, a stainless will work as usual, everything works. Now, this looks like link, and for the most part it is, but notice here, what happens if I don't have a manager? So let's look at someone that does not have a manager. And in this case, if I remember correctly, this is Andrew. And Andrew doesn't have a manager. But it is indexed. But the problem here, this is going to return null, and now we have an unreference exception. Let's see the raw results. We have just name here. We don't have the manager name. And this is because even though this looks like link, it's not quite. The indexes inside of RevenDB are using a null coalescing by default, which means that if this is null, the entire thing is going to return null and you're going to get no result back. So in general, in indexing RevenDB, you don't really need to worry about, oh, how do I, uh, how do I uh, handle nulls? You can just ignore that and everything will work. Now, I already shown you some part of that, which is using create field in order to generate dynamic values. In this case, I'm, allow, I'm using attributes, and this is a dictionaries, and I'm basically just saying, okay, key and value, each one of them generate an attribute that I can query on. If this product has a color red, I can query, okay, give me products where the color is red. Notice that I'm using underscore here as a note to RevenDB that this index is using dynamic values. So we don't need to validate the field names because they're dynamic. I previously also talked about uh, using that for the pricing and uh, quantity list and stuff like that. Uh, something to note here, RevenB has a limit of 64,000 documents, uh, so 64,000 uh, uh, fields in an index. This is huge. You should never ever even get close to that. Uh, however, if you have something like this and you have truly unbounded values, you have to pay attention to that. And if you want to say, oh, I want to have F a, a, a specific price for each one of them, 
uh, talking about for the quantities. I want to have a, a fee for each quantity. I'm going to select one from zero to 200,000, and I want to generate a fee for one of those. That would fail. Don't do that. It tends to be easier to aggregate around known good values. And that's usually uh, how things work in the, real, in the real world because this makes things easy. Okay, let's talk about MapReduce. Uh, what we have here is really simple. But in the same sense, people have a hard time understanding how it works. So let's look at a very simple aggregation. We have this index. And you might notice I'm actually doing all of that in the live session, in the live instance of RevenDB, using the demo da data. We work very hard to make sure that the data gives you, the sample database gives you enough information to actually do something with the data. And now you can see that I'm going over all of the orders, outputting the total and the count. And that works. And then in the reduce, I'm saying, okay, let's group things by the company and then sum each one of those. This is the output that we get for company 85, five orders and 1480 total. Now, the key here is that these two are running in a separate stages and the, re the reduce can run multiple times. Because this is such a hard thing to understand, let's talk about this in detail. Here is the simplest thing. We have five orders for 85, and this is the total. Makes sense. You can see here how we got to this total. We run the reduce on all of those values to get the final result. This makes sense. Now, Let's make things slightly more interesting for us. And what I'm doing right now, I'm increasing the number of orders for a company's 85 by 100. And now we have hopefully enough to discuss things in detail. Now we have 500 of them, which is good. Notice that again, this is the total for this document. The whole idea is that I'm running these things and these things while I'm indexing. So I did the computation in each order and then I aggregate all of them together. And let me just go back here. And this gives us the right results. Now, let's go and add some more data. And again, now we're going to move from 505 orders to uh, 50,000 orders. And we'll let it run. This is actually quite amazing. This is the live instance and uh, it's a really underpowered one. Okay, so now let's go back. And now we are asking it, okay, let's give it the same results again. But now notice that we have 50,000 50, results in the index, in the uh, for companies uh, 85. And I think that we confuse it with, this is not, this UI not really meant for when you update an existing value where the state change. And now we can see something really, really interesting. Here is the uh, result as we expect, and here is the total. So here, here are the map, and here are the map results. Make sense? Now we take the reduce and run it here. Also makes sense. But we have another 70 like that. So we take this and all of them 
and run the reduce again over this values and this values and get to this, fu this final value. Make sense? I hope so. So the idea here is that the moment that we started doing that, we get, at some point, we get too big. And instead of doing just one reduce stage, we do multiple. And at that point, it means that we have a really significant benefit because adding a new order right now means doing the following. Run the map once and add it to this location. Run the reduce on this one, run the reduce on this one, and then you're done. So in two stages, you got the fine tally. Now, we have a question from Bento. Is it possible to make a map reduce with the average cells over the past 30 days? And the answer is somewhat yes. The downside of using a map reduce in the way that Revenue does that is that we need to understand the data. Do we need to understand what are we querying on? So, Let's build an index for profit per month, because that's easier, and then discuss a sell monthly. Then discuss how this works in a, a more details. A order. And let me just copy this. Now, form result in results, group result by Uh, result dot here, result dot month, so what we're doing here, we're saying, you know what, let's take all of this and just throw it into a, into a grouping of by company per month, per month and year. Now, we can do it easier like this. Company, year and month. Uh, yeah, we don't need count here. No, let's uh, do count. No, one second. Select here. I'm missing a comma on line five. Yes, thank you. I'm typically better at doing live demos. Uh, here we go. It says monthly. Here are the monthly sets. Oh, I forgot that we have quite a few documents here, so you can see how it goes. Now, here are the totals, and if we are able to do that normally, it works. And as you see, it's very easy. However, Bento's question is, how can I do that on the past 30 days? In order to answer for the past 30 days, I have to do, oh, sorry, I have to do something slightly more complex. I'm going to do it like this. Or I could just do this. So what I'm doing right now, I'm doing this on a daily basis. And, and here are the results on a daily basis. And there seems to be some days where we have some interesting cells, but for the most part, it's not interesting. 
Now, let's say where, co where company equal company slash 28, let's say. And date between 1996, 07, let's say 17. And let's say, now we get this. But I don't want this. I want, uh, now I got all of the total sales in, uh, in that type of them, but I want the aggregation. Now, in this case, the key here is that I want those things to be completely dynamic. I may, I may want to choose any sort of range that I want. So at that point, I can apply a facet. And let me see if I remember how it goes. No, let's see. I think that, I know that some exist. And the sum is, okay, I had 14 cells and this is the total value for that time period. Let's see if that makes sense. Sort of. If we do this. And, okay. Now, average. Okay, that was average. And that's how you can do that on a, as a query. So let's do in MapReduce the, the, uh, the computation on a daily basis. And that gives me, no, okay, now I need the last 30 days. Okay, now I'm going to you do the work on query time. But the work that you need to do on query time is now instead of, oh, I may have, you know, 50,000 uh, orders, now I have to process 30 daily records, which is much, much, much cheaper. Uh, on the other hand, the whole idea is whatever you need past 30 days or past month. If this is past month, it's much easier for to be. If not, you use this and this still works. Okay, so this is simple MapReduce. Let's talk about something slightly more complex. Take a minute to look into this code and let's understand what's going on. In this case, we are not aggregating just on the company. We also aggregate over the data itself. What this will give me in the end is the total number of a, a products and how many of them I purchase on each company. Take a minute to, to, to understand how this works. I'm not going to demo that because I'm going to demo something even more interesting than this guy. I want to do product recommendations. So let's see how it works. In for each orders, let's go for each of the lines and get the product and get all of the other products on this order that are not this one. Now I'm going to reduce the result by the product, aggregate the total sales for this particular product, and then I'm doing, going to do internal aggregation by the related product, sum the total times this was bought with this one, and here is the total that we have. And also, for fun, let's order that, order that by the most interesting products. Let's see how that works. And this is annoying enough to type that I actually prepare ahead of time. And this is the one. Here is the output. Product 11 was purchased quite a few times along with product 72. That's nice. If we go and look at 
the index, we're going to see something interesting. This, these three products were purchased together in this order. We're going to go here and we're going to see that, okay, here is product 42, it was purchased with 11 and 72, and here are the total for this product in general. Here are the total total across everything. So in many cases, we tend to consider MapReduce indexes for simple data, sum, account, those sort of things. I wanted to remind you that you have much better facilities to express real complex data flows. And if you think about that, this actually does product recommendations. And that means that you can truly get the results of a product instantly. We have a question from Josh. Can you comment on the situation where documents that were included in MapReduce index get deleted? So like a sum example, when those values will be subtracted back out, is it expensive? So what happened when we need to, uh, what happened when we need to remove values? So let's try to figure it out. And let's take the non-trivial index intentionally. And somewhere around here, there is, let's say that I remove this value. So what do I need to do that? There are 505 items in this location. This is actually a eight kilobyte page inside of Raven. So I'm removing a value from here. Let's say I'm removing this one. Then I need to re reduce all of the 505 values here. Remember, in this case, it is literally not possible to subtract that. I don't have a simple value. I have a complex operation. So instead of trying to figure out how to do subtractions, we're just going to reduce all of this. And so I have to do 504 operations now. And then I have to take and do 21 additional operations. Take this, the new value that we computed, and the other values that we have computed here and get to the final tally here. So in a sense, the cost in number of items that have to reduce is 525, exactly. In practice, we can call it of two because that's the height we need to traverse. And the short of it is that no, you don't have to worry about updates or deletes or stuff like that. If you think about it, update has the same exact problem with deletes, especially when you allow to have more complex issues, more complex uh, indexes and transformations. Now, the output of an index resides in the index. And that's nice, it allows us to do some interesting things. But more interestingly, it allows us to also say something like this. Let's take the output of a MapReduce index and throw that into an index, into a collection. And what this is going to generate is this index with the values. Now, you may say, why do I want something like that? And the answer is that if the output of the index is a collection of documents, I can do other document stuff to it. For example, I could build additional map reduce on that. If you look at the sales daily, I have sales monthly and sales daily. I don't need to aggregate the whole data Again, I can do this, and in the monthly, let's run over this. And And here we 
go. Now, Sales Monthly give me the exact same information, but let's look what it operates on. It's operate on this. It doesn't operate on the orders where we have 50,000 items. It operates over the sales daily where we have however many items this is. And here are the raw results from the sales daily and the aggregated ones. So this has to do things like recursive map reduce. And the idea of doing daily and monthly in this fashion is very common to allow you to have these stepping stones. Another thing that it allows you to do is to do things like, oh, let's use ETL to push it to some other location. Let's be able to run a subscription on this collection so whenever the source data changes, it gets transformed, aggregated, then I get just information that I want. For example, maybe I'm interested in, okay, tell me when a customer purchased more than $10,000 on a single day. I can set up a query like this, using subscriptions. And let's see if I have, okay, good. So I can do. Uh, Sorry, let's say count more than 10,000 10, uh, Okay. So we can see here that uh, here is a customer and I get some of those. Now I can save this and set up a subscription to this. And whenever there is a new order on a customer that purchased more than 10,000 orders today, I can react to that immediately. Another thing to notice is that we also have this, reference to results collection. What, what's that? Let's look at this. In particular, let's look at this. The idea that we have here is effectively random. I have no idea how to do to do it. But in many cases, Remini has a lot of features that touch on the idea of a document. So the whole idea is that we are able to say, you know what, I want to have some way of referencing that in a consistent fashion. Let's save this. Here are the here are the product recommendations, but now I want to get the product recommendation for product 9A. And I can get it here, get it here. Now, why does it matter? Let me show you why. From products, and let's say, uh, Uh, categories. Here are some of them, which is nice. But I want to also get the okay. I want to also get the uh, related products. Uh, and I'm going to do it like this because that's easier for me. And what's your problem? Oh, yes, yeah, sorry. I wish that there was some consistency between C Sharp and this. Uh, yes, okay. This is the day for typos. So now I have this, and now I have reduced outputs. Uh, 
and he had related. And in slightly more work, I can get all of the related documents and work with them. I have to do a flat map here basically to extract those. And now in one query to the database, using the fact that I have a consistent naming strategy here to refer to the actual results, I'm able to pull here the related products in this category. And let's also pull the products that uh, I should recommend for them. Okay. Now, this is a 5.0 feature. RevenDB allows you to define counters on documents. Counters is a value that is stored outside of the document itself. It is meant to change rapidly, concurrently, and all of those sorts of things. For example, a final file download counter is a really good example of that. It's very common that two users will download the value, the file at the same time, and want to increment that concurrently and in a distributed fashion. The problem with doing that is handled by counters. I talked about this in previous webinars, it's covered very well in the documentation. The new feature in Favo is that now you're able to index on the counters. And you can see here that we're saying, okay, let's go over all of the uh, file downloads counters. This is the collection of the, the document. This is the name of the counter that we want to index. And we're doing this and we can load the related document and everything works as usual. The idea here is that now you're able to say, okay, show me the most popular values for some time frame. Show me the file that was downloaded the most times and fetch the data from the counter itself. Now, the issue here is that counter may change very rapidly. If they change very rapidly, they would have to be indexed each and every time. So notice that if you're doing that and you actually have rapidly changing values, it may create a, some load on the uh, indexing infrastructure. This is going to be isolated in its own trade, it's not going to impact anything else, but be aware that there is some resources that are going to be consumed here. In the same manner, this is again a file feature, we have the ability to query or to index over time series. Now we already have the ability to query over time series. That's time series queries. And I'm going to have a, a full webinar just about that later this month, I think. But the whole idea here is that now I'm able to do this sort of aggregation to give you on an hourly basis, get you the average value and output it out. From here, I can pull another map reduce. I can do uh, aggregation across series values, across many documents, those sorts of things, and allow you to do some really interesting things uh, with this information. Now, something to understand. Indexes are orthogonal. That means that all of the features that we have on indexes, things like full text search, analyzers, uh, boosting of values, all sorts of things are available across everything. You can have a multi-map of documents, counter and time series, and then apply a reduce across everything. You can have a index on time series that end up doing spatial uh, index. All sorts of other stuff like that. And the whole idea is that this is built in such a way that you can compose them as you wish. Uh, there are a bunch of other things that I would suggest you look at. I don't think that uh, I have time here. I think that I'm already out of time and it's very great that I can do that on a webinar form because then I have no one saying, oh, we need a room. Uh, suggestions allow you to fix spelling mistakes. Highlight shows you where things are if you had a... Uh, if you've done a full text search, boost in order to select exactly how you should rank your queries. Uh, there is this thing that allows you to do event sourcing with RevenDB indexes. I'm going to give you just a little taste of that. I will warn you up front, it's non-trivial. So we have the following data. We have some add to counts which adds some product to a particular cart. We have a car payment, two of them, one by cash, one by visa. 
and a remove from count. What we don't have is the actual count. We can get it from here. Here's the actual count, and this is actually composed of all of the events that we had. Breathe deeply, this is what we do here. So for each of the item to count, we generate a count, which nothing on the page, it has, this is the count ID, and here are the products that I have here. For remove from count, I have negative quantity, same thing here. Pay for count, I don't care about this, but I'm saying that I paid for that. So far, so good. Now, this should probably be this, actually. So it bugs me to see that. Right, result, everything is okay. Now, so let's see what's going on here. Now you can see here, this is the add item to count. I have nothing here. This is, again, add item to count. This is remove item from count. This is a pay by visa, this is a pay by cash. So those are all of the output values from the various maps that I have. And I strongly recommend if you're dealing with non-trivial indexes, use this feature. It's amazing to understand what's going on. Now, let's see what we're actually doing. And take a deep breath. We are grouping by the car, so everything in here is done on a particular, uh, already grouped by a particular count. So now it's saying, okay, let's go over all of the uh, uh, values and let's reduce them or to get the products. So for each one of those, get the related product. If it exists, add it. If it doesn't, move on. Notice that we handle the case of uh, if, if there are two different prices for the same product, we are going to remove it. Everything works. After we have done this, we are finding if there are any products who has no quantity, so we remove them. Otherwise, we increase the total due. Then we figure out how much will, was paid in total on each one of those values. We compute the total paid, and that's basically it. There is nothing really complex going on here. I thank goodness for that because debugging JavaScript is not a, a, a nice thing to do. But what this allows me to do is to generate events directly into WebNDB, define some transformation process that go over them, and ultimately the results. And remember, oh, I want this to be, I want to be able to index and do searches on cards, no problem. Uh, here we go. And now I have the card data. Now, oh, I want to index that, you want to query on that, everything, it's right here. And here's the card data reference, which has that. As I said, everything is orthogonal, you can compose everything. Hopefully, I didn't scale too much with the last feature. Now is the time for now is the time for questions. David, do we have any questions on Facebook? Uh no, no questions on Facebook. Okay, so Ryan is asking, are there examples of this event sourcing index in C Sharp? Yes, uh, 
Let's see if I can find it. There's a whole bunch of videos about this. Uh, I think this is, let's see where it's at. No, this, uh, that's, I don't think this is it. Oh, here we go. So here are the, uh, here we go. So here is an example of doing a, a event sourcing in a C Sharp. Here is the summary raise event. Here is the pre-register event. And you aggregated everything to get you the total values that we have. Uh, Ryan is saying, those posts are fairly old. Could you put, do a webinar on that? Are you talking about doing a webinar on event sourcing with RevenDB? If so, yes, we can do that. Uh, however, drop us an email, give us some interesting scenarios. I would love to have something that is beyond just the demo to, uh, to talk about. Troy is, uh, Troy is saying, how would you do a view on a product and showing all of the products, the view the view after that? Is that a combination of event sourcing. Troy, what do you mean? Uh, you're saying if, I'm not sure that, uh, that, uh, uh, that I understand the question. Uh, let's see if I can find you. Troy, uh, if you can unmute your mic and... Uh, can you hear me? This is Troy. Yes. Can you expand your scenario? So, like, kind of like if you go into Amazon.com and you're viewing a product and it uh -huh. says, you know, other customers viewed this product also, kind of like mm -hmm. that. Yeah. It, that's, I mean, and it's sometimes, you know, I've seen them where it's like viewed this product after this product. In other words, I saw this product, then I saw some you know, maybe like related items, and then I went to the related item and saw it. And so the question it's, is kind of how is this that? This is basically it. Okay. So the whole idea is that from the point of view of your application, all you need to generate is some grouping, or in this case, we have the line items. But give me a, the list of items that a the user view in particular order. And then we're basically going to generate that and say, okay, for each one of those, and uh, that would be, That would be something like this. That will give you, okay, all of the orders that follow that particular one. Because you have that, and the rest is basically just the same, and you get the appropriate grouping. Now, the whole idea is that you can do that. So, okay, assuming that you have this particular uh, this particular scenario, you may want to say, okay, I want to see the pro the other three products that uh, you saw afterward, you search for afterward. Given that information, you have a list on per user, what are the searches of the products that they viewed or looked at, and that gives you enough information to say, okay, given that information, I'm going to output for each one of, the, of each user. So it will be something like this. Uh, 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 for P, Now, next three items, and then you output that. And from here, you basically just do the, the same thing here. You would aggregate that, so uh, if you looked at 
shoes and then you you looked at socks and uh, I don't know uh, sneakers and then ballet shoes and I looked at shoes and then I looked at uh, pants then uh, the overall value would be okay uh, now I have uh, the next for each of you I have the next three items that they saw I'm going to aggregate all of that to give you the most common items that will viewed after this particular product. I hope I'm explaining that properly. I don't have the right uh, uh, data to show that, but it's pretty much the same thing as the product recommendation. It's just different at the sort. Yeah, I think that last um, that you mentioned was right on target. Okay. Uh, so thank you. Guys, any more, uh, any more questions you would like to, to answer? If not, then I thank you very much. I had a lot. Of, I have a lot of fun doing these webinars. Uh, one thing I would ask you: please give us feedback on what topics you would like to talk about. I consider all of the things that we have here are ninety percent of them are things that we had for a decade. I don't consider them new. I don't consider them newsworthy. And the problem is that in many cases, people come to me and they know, don't know what they don't know. If you would like, I would give us some scenarios to talk about if you have, oh, I have this particular application that uh, I need this feature, stuff like that. We would include that into the webinar queues and I will see you in the, in the next week. But I have from Samira, is this documentation available for this to refer in the future? Yes. Everything that I talked about is included in the documentation. In addition to that, you can also go here, and this is the RevenDB book. You can access that from here, learn inside the RevenDB book. And I'm covering a lot of ground here, talking about all of those uh, additional things. And in addition to that, all of this, uh, no, this one, or the cloud, this is the just the usual one. And this is all covered around here. So again, come see us next week. Thank you very much.